Grant, hello. I'm very happy to talk to you today. You are also a participant of the summit in summer this year. I'm very glad that you will join. You are really a pioneer art historian. You followed this development already in the last century. So the first point, the first question is, uh, give us a bit information. How did you come into computer art or was it from the very beginning that you decided you want to do art history on the media side? Sure. Well, thank you, Susan, for inviting me to the summer. I'm really excited to be uh, in Berlin in the summer. I'm normally when I'm in Europe, it's in the winter. So I'm really looking forward to, to coming and, and uh, meeting up with everyone uh, in July. So yeah, I mean, I was interested in new media uh, as an undergraduate. Uh, so everything digital interested me. But as I was moving into the world of um, art history and looking for a longer project, uh, I was really looking for a topic where there was a significant gap of, of knowledge, you know. So I was doing a lot of reading on the history of computer art and the, the question why, why, why was there so much criticism of computer art? And there was no answer to that in the literature. So I thought, okay, there is a gap, a gap in knowledge. I can actually go ahead and research what it is that made uh, critics, artists themselves, the, the, the larger cultural sphere react to computer art uh, during the 60s. Uh, 70s and 80s and beyond so it was really um it's 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 a gap in knowledge and I wanted to fill that and it starts with the question why why did this happen and what is so great about the topic is there is a, a fair bit of conflict and discontent and that that makes for a great narrative uh, so that's how I got involved in the field and I really was interested in the larger issues the mythology surrounding computers and how that was impacting on people's perception. So that that's that was my entrance into the field. Can you tell us a bit more about uh, this the subject you just mentioned? Uh, why was the critics as it was? Uh, did you find reasons for it that you can explain in short terms? Um, what what happened? I think uh, there was a number of things happening. I think the computer itself. There was a lot of mystery around it and its perceived power. So we had the technologists and the scientists saying this uh, this entity, this digital entity, this machine is going to be very powerful and it's going to change the world, which it did, obviously. Uh, and, uh, and the traditional artists and the critics, um, they didn't know a lot about the computer and how it worked. They didn't They weren't used to thinking necessarily algorithmically in, in a way. Uh, so they didn't understand both the, the software and the uh, obviously the uh, mechanical uh, engine part of the computer. So I think it's all based on fear, you know, so fear of the unknown. And that that's something that continues right through today. So we're, we're unsure about the powers of um, this, uh, entity, this uh, artificial entity that we have uh, produced and made and created. And we, 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 we worry about its power. So I think in, in the reception criticism was uh, the fear of the computer itself um, and uh, a way of kind of making fun of those early graphics as the computer is starting to evolve graphics. And it, it takes a while. We We have the, some major movements uh, in the 50s and 60s in graphics. And so the graphics were relatively, uh, they were, although they were precise, um, they were simple geometric figures, which, of course, the artistic hand can do quite easily, uh, or even a servo mechanical device can do that easily. So it was like, uh, why are we getting so excited about this, not really understanding how many leaps and bounds it had taken to get the computer to do this. So I think it's a, a bit of both. It's an aesthetic judgment that was premature and it is a larger fear of the machine itself, which we still have today. Of course, the machine, the computer can create incredible complexity uh, and um, 
imagery uh, that we couldn't have in the in the early 60s. Uh, so that aesthetic uh, element has disappeared somewhat, but the fear of the computer, especially artificial intelligence is still here. How about you? Uh, did your um, opinion or your evaluation change over time? So do you see some changement on your side, uh, looking back to your own history in the 80s and nowadays? Uh, what's different for you? When I think about um, the early artifacts of, of computer-generated art, I, I think that we have now recognized them as um, very important and worth preserving and celebrating. That that has changed. That wasn't always the case. Um, you know, there was artifacts that were just thrown away, th put, put into garages, and we, we've lost a lot. But now that has really changed. We, we realize that those early artifacts uh, are, are so important to the history, not only of art, but of, of humankind. So that I think that really has, has changed. Um, But I think technology has has evolved in ways that we didn't predict, you know, especially in terms of social media and um, interconnectivity and smaller devices. Uh, so, of course, I'm going to talk a little bit about that at the conference uh, in terms of predicting the future of art. But uh, I think I think it's really interesting in the way that um, digital art, digital media, um, generative art how it developed in ways that uh, we didn't necessarily perceive. Now, not to say that some of the elements that were so important to, to generative art, like algorithmic art, um, artificial life um, uh, programs, uh, fractals, they are all still present in all the art that we, we think of when we think of the larger uh, sphere of digital art. So looking at this term generative art, uh, can you explain uh, as an art historian, what's the essence of this term for you? Um, how is it defined? So uh, generative art, when I think of generative art, I really think of uh, not the artifact itself. So what is produced that we see on the screen or on the wall. Uh, or, or whatever we interact with. Um, I think more of the artist, the artist practice. So um, I think of uh, generative art, uh, obviously in terms of al algorithmically, uh, as something that is 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 programmed, there is there is a certain code. But beyond that, I really think of it as an as an artist who is, interacting with a program over a, 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 a period of time, linear time, and they are making decisions on what that program or that generative element is producing. So it is a decision-making pr program, a linear program in which this art is evolving and producing either images or sounds or sights Uh, and the, the artist is following certain paths and making certain decisions in time. And that, to me, is generative art. So um, we have the generative engine, the thing that is producing, say, in, in the example of form, a form that is produced, and then the artist is picking that form, making adjustments to the parameters of that generative machine, be it a computer or something else, um, and that is uh, producing new form, And the artist is following that that path. So to me, some of the concepts, key concepts is the engine, the path, decision making and changes of parameters. So you would also agree, I guess, that um, uh, it is something like an exchange or a dialogue between human and machine. I think so. I mean, that's how it's been defined by a lot of uh, key artists in the field, um, the both the pioneers and contemporary artists. And what that's what makes it so interesting with artificial intelligence, I think, is what is the conversation? Um, yeah, as uh, if you are if you're in conversation or you're in collaboration with a digital entity that um, is 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 producing things that you've never seen, but then you make adjustments to that that parameters to produce new uh, new output. Um, what is the relationship when the artificial intelligence gets to a point where um, it's, it's no longer collaborative 
Uh, and that's what I think is interesting about today's um, where we are today. Is, is the artist depending on the machine or uh, how is is the quest how would you say who who is the author who 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 makes the artwork is it the human alone or is it the human and the machine both together i'm i'm always talking about the artist is involved in a temporal way it's not just putting a couple of keywords and letting this thing generate an image um, it is a it is something that the the artist has had is setting the parameters of this um, program to the to the extent that they have a sense of its boundaries. Uh, they don't know everything it's going to produce, but they have a sense of it that's much more than at the consumer level um, would. So, uh, you know, I I think I think the difference is now. Uh, previously, you where we had artists build their own. Um, programs that they interacted with some of them weren't artificial uh, intelligence but some were um, artificial life for example or just generative uh, programs that would produce form I think the difference now is that they're so complex with the with um, the large language models LM LLMs is that the conversation between the artist and and uh, the artificial intelligence is is more complex so there is the possibility i think of more evaluative response from an um, artificial intelligence entity uh, that we didn't have before meaning that they can they can judge your decision making right um uh you know where where that wasn't necessarily the case the the artist was much more more in control of the process which i think is interesting so when does it become if if the uh, artificial intelligence entity starts to to criticize the the decision makings or the parameters set by the artist that there's real conflict there right um and i think that's that's an area that we haven't we haven't started to move in, but it, it's ahead of us. Um, how do you see the fact? I, I had several talks in, in the last day with real pioneers who, who made their codes and, and were at the front of the development. Um, and they have a clear picture. They say the code is the most important thing. And some of them clearly articulate that uh, they feel that nowadays um, where you have so much tools and so much software and everything is already existing, you do not have to think about it or behind it, uh, behind the code. Um, they have the feeling that the artists are losing the background of what they are doing, uh, what they felt very strong because they, they had to create the background before they could do anything that conflict between the, the coders and, and artists that used uh, ready-made software has been in place really since the 1980s. Um, and so there was, um, you know, you would have uh, conferences and uh, exhibitions where the, the coders, uh, those who wrote their art making systems uh, would look down on those uh, that are using the new um, like paint, paint box software, uh, and, and then called it canned art. Um, but for me, um, I think both processes um, have are, are still guiding uh, the computer, right? The, uh, the generative element. And both of them produce uh, often different results, but uh, equally interesting um, work. So, um, I follow, you know, when I studied them, I studied both ends of it. So I looked at artists that were using uh, prepackaged software, um, paint tools and so on, but also all the artists that wrote their own code. Um, to me, I agree that the coder knows much more about the boundaries, the parameters of, of their system. Um, and uh, that produces a long 
relationship with that piece of code, which is fascinating. That's why I was talking about a linear one. Whereas if you're using um, pre-packaged software, you don't have necessarily have that long-term relationship with this code that you've developed over a period of time. So I think that is a fundamental difference. You, you mentioned um, looking a bit into future that you see that we are heading to a time where new things will come up that a machine um, takes over, could take over the process of creating, I, I would say. I, I'm not quite sure whether you would accept that, but I would like to hear some, some ideas from your side. Uh, when you think about artificial intelligence is getting more intelligent, whatever that means, you know, it's not intelligence in, in a human sense, of course, but gets even more data, get, has the full data set of the world um, and and can can do things extremely fast. So um, what 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 will happen? What do you see uh, coming? In I think it, it, it's going to be more powerful. It's going to be a more powerful entity to collaborate with, right? So um, I, I find it uh, the exploration of that really interesting because it's going to answer some questions. And we've always wanted that. So we've wanted... We've always wanted a, um, um, a, a artificial or digital entity to judge our art. Sometimes it was basic aesthetic uh, parameters. Um, we've always wanted um, these entities, obviously, to produce uh, variety uh, of forms that then we can uh, we can judge and 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 move forward in a path of um, collaborative cre uh, creativity. But um, we've never had this entity that is um, perhaps uh, critical of the artist's uh, intentions. So if there's certain biases in a, in a system or in a way of working, um, the machine now can, can uh, uh, both sense those, uh, predict those, and um, criticize those. And I, I think we've just never been in a place like that. 